All right, I'm going to throw up my slides if I can get uh, nodding or a thumbs up when you can see it. Can see uh, it. Perfect. So I'm really excited to be here and I'm really grateful that we've got 40 minutes because I'll tell you one of the greatest challenges of my entire career was trying to teach advanced care planning in 20 minutes in the in the last event. And so uh, I'm really grateful for the extra time today and I'm hopeful um, that you'll be able to engage well with the content. I am going to put a link in the chat. Um, and that link can take you to our Fraser Health Advanced Care Planning Workbook. And so it's a workbook that covers all the five steps of advanced care planning that I'm going to talk about today. And one that you can either use as a fillable PDF document or one that you could print off and actually write in yourself. Um, so I'm leaving that in the chat and hoping that you might be able to access that either now as we do the session or definitely um, after the session, you're more than welcome to look that up. I wanna express my gratitude uh, and acknowledge that I am on the unceded and traditional lands of the Coast Salish people. Um, I think in the last few days with the flooding on these beautiful lands, it's been especially um, poignant to, to be grateful for these lands and their, their fragility, but also just as a settler, I wanna acknowledge the stewardship that the Coast Salish peoples have offered these lands and how it's especially benefited me during this pandemic to ground me um, on this journey. So I want to start by uh, talking a little bit about an example of being shipwrecked. And I know that might be a little bit too soon um, after some serious flooding to talk about a ship and, and boats, um, and especially with the, the everything that's happened. But I, I want to use this example because I feel like it really brings what advanced care planning is about to life. So I want you to picture and imagine that you have been shipwrecked on an island. You are all by yourself uh, on a deserted island, just waiting. And suddenly you receive a message in a bottle stating that at some time in the future, there may be a boat that comes by and you need to decide right now if you wanna get on that boat. What would be your answer? So I want you to stop for a minute, think, reflect on what would you do? Now, when I do this session in the public, back when we used to actually meet in person, um, a lot of people would raise their hands and say, you know what, I actually, you know, half of the group would say yes, some of the other half would say no. And then some people would say, I've actually got some questions before I get on this boat. And that's usually the people I want to say, well, tell me more. What are the questions that you have? And so a lot of people ask the question of, well, what kind of island is it? Because if it's an island like the one in front of us, like Bora Bora, um, I'm okay staying on that island as long as possible, especially after this two-year pandemic. Or if it's a really deserted island where sharks are literally swimming around the island and waiting for me to dip my toe in the water, I'll probably be far more tempted to get on that boat. Other questions that people ask us are, well, what kind of boat is it? Um, is it a boat where, similar to the Charleston Heston scene on your right there, uh, you have to do all the manual labor to even get it working? Uh, I used to look at this image and say, that's not the boat I want to be on. But I have a female colleague who looked at that picture and said, that's the boat I want to be on. Look at all those muscular men. Now, is it a yacht? Again, if it was one of these beautiful boats, that might change your mind versus if it was one where you had to do the manual labor. Uh, when we think about what kind of boat is it that's coming? Another question that usually people from the public ask us when we do this presentation is, well, how safe is the trip? Again, when we think about the Titanic, there wasn't a single person who got on that boat who didn't think that that trip was gonna be, be, uh, be unsafe. They all got on it with confidence that it was gonna be a safe trip. And so again, we might ask ourselves, well, how safe is this boat trip? And finally, we can't help but ask the question, where will the boat take me? I look at this house and especially living in the Vancouver real estate market, I think that looks like a fantastic destination to end up at. But again, I have a, my, my colleague, Carrie, looks at this picture. And she's very quick to ask, well, who's actually going to do the cleaning of that house? And so maybe that might be, not be the largest house destination she'd like to be taken to. So what does this have to do with our health? You probably came to this session wanting to learn more about your health, and here we are talking about being shipwrecked. Well, here's how I wanted to relate it to your health. I want you to think about either yourself or someone who's important to you being diagnosed with a heart disease. And you've been told that your heart may stop sometime in the future, and you need to decide right now if you want to attempt resuscitation or CPR if that happens. You've got about five minutes to decide what would be your answer. 
And I want you to think about that for a minute. What would be your answer? Would you want resuscitation? Would you not? Again, often there are people in the audience who are very adamant that they for sure want it or for sure don't want it. And then there's others among you who might say, I have some questions, just like the, the, the shipwrecked experience. And so let's compare some of those questions related to the shipwrecked uh, example with our health issues. So when we ask the question of what kind of island is it that we're on, it's similar to asking the question, well, what are my current health problems and what are the prognoses or what is the, the, the trajectory of my health issues look like? When we're asking what kind of ship, again, it's similar to asking, well, what kind of treatments are actually being offered and what are the risks and the benefits of those treatments? When we ask ourselves, how safe is the trip? It's similar to asking how safe are these treatments, which obviously has been a big question in the media lately in terms of, of COVID-19. And finally, where is this gonna take me is the question, are the treatments gonna get me where I want to go? What I want you to know is that when we talk about advanced care planning today, it is not talking about death and dying. Um, today, we're gonna to talk about living. Advanced care planning is about how we want to live. And so really the most important question on this screen is that last one on the bottom right. Uh, and even on the left, where is it going to take me? Are the treatments going to get me where I want to go? Advanced care planning is really ensuring that the decisions that we make related to our health, and if other people have to make them for us, allow us to get to the destinations or to live the way that we want to live. That is the essence of advanced care planning. So today's session is really going to focus on that question in particular. So what is advanced care planning? Well, put simply, it's just really rearranging those words. It's planning in advance for your healthcare. So what does that look like? Because for some people that might sound like, oh, I need to choose certain treatments in advance. No, we don't know exactly what treatments are even gonna be on offer, let alone if it's actually gonna help us in that moment. So choosing treatments in advance based on hypothetical situations is actually typically not very helpful. And the research has shown that as well. But when we think about life planning, we realize that a lot of us spend a lot of energy often doing financial planning, so planning for our finances, and even doing what we call belongings planning or estate planning related to the end of life. But it's oftentimes we forget about our health and our health planning and that advanced care planning component, recognizing that there's very little we can do with our money or our belongings if we're not living in a healthy or at least in the way that we want to and what's important to us. So when we talk about advanced care planning, we always like to remind people that planning is planning. So whether it's financial planning, estate planning, or advanced care planning, they're all forms of planning that we should be engaging in at all different points in our life. You know, oftentimes it's when we uh, get married or enter into a relationship or have children that we start that financial planning and that estate planning. It's a, equally a very good time for us to think about advanced care planning. Or it's usually when there's a crisis in their family or in our lives where we think about our financial and estate planning. And that's a really good time to also think about advanced care planning. So is advanced care planning only for seniors? No. Are we at a seniors fair today? Yes. But does that mean that advanced care planning is not meant for your adult children, for your grandchildren, or for your neighbors who may be younger? Absolutely, it's meant for everyone. Advanced care planning is for any age and any stage of life. Um, we all are susceptible to becoming sick or unwell. This uh, COVID-19 pandemic has really made us all far more aware of our mortality and our fragility to being able to become sick uh, quite quickly and losing the capacity to even communicate for ourselves. And so because of that, we need to know that it's not just waiting until we're older. It's not just waiting until that new serious health diagnosis. It's really something that we should all be starting as early as possible. Now, some of you may have att be attending this session and asking, well, why should I even do advanced care planning, Andrew? And we get asked that question often. And I used to call these excuses, um, but I've now come to be far more empathetic, just that these are genuine concerns and reasons why people question why they should even begin or to engage in advanced care planning. So we have people who tell us, Andrew, I'm, I'm, I'm young and healthy. Why do I need to do this? And I think we've, I've already tried to dispel that myth a little bit by really emphasizing that just because we're young and healthy today doesn't mean we'll be young. Well, it doesn't mean we'll still be young, but doesn't mean we'll necessarily be healthy tomorrow. Um, and just because uh, we seem to feel like our age protects us from certain health issues, crises, or even any sort of injuries, that actually isn't the case. We have people who share, well, I've had bad experiences with the healthcare system. 
Well, I'll tell you right now, I know very few people who haven't had a bad experience with the healthcare system. And you'll discover that advanced care planning actually helps you to feel like you have a sense of control uh, in a system, the healthcare system, that often feels very much out of control. People tell us that they don't like to think or talk about death. And as I've already shared, advanced care planning isn't about death and dying. It's really about how you want to live right up until the very end. Um, so it's not about death and dying. We get people who tell us, well, my family makes decisions together, so why should I do planning for myself? A really great point, but again, I think we're going to highlight today how it actually supports and helps your family in making those decisions together when you do advanced care planning. People who trust in fate, what will be will be, que sera, sera. Um, again, another reason why people share that they don't want to or don't feel the need to engage in advanced care planning. And finally, I'm someone who changes their mind a lot. And what you're going to learn about advanced care planning is that it's a process. It's not an event. Unlike when we do our will and then we're done with it, advanced care planning is, is, a, is a series of conversations that, that continue to change and adapt as we age and as we grow, as the people who are important to us change and the things that we like to do change. Um, so changing our mind is totally normal and expected in the advanced care planning process. Oftentimes, our reasons or our answers to why we feel like we should be doing this work is because life is unpredictable. Planning gives you control over what happens to you in the future. Uh, and again, I think this pandemic has shown us really how unpredictable life can be. This flooding has highlighted that as well. And again, when we feel like we're out of control, having that sense that we've already put some things in place or thought about things or had conversations makes us feel like we are a little bit more grounded in the midst of that crisis. If you don't make plans, the law is gonna decide for you anyways. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. And putting plans in place helps guide the people who matter to you to make decisions that you would make for yourself. And so again, I, I don't know any of you have ever given a birthday present or a Christmas present to someone that you thought that they would really love, and then they didn't. Um, oftentimes, the easiest way to avoid that is just by straight up asking them, what do you want? And it's the same thing with advanced care planning. Sometimes if we don't actually explicitly ask what's important to them or what they would like or how they'd like to live, we may or may not make the right choice that would be meaningful and important to them. We did complete this survey a few years ago in British Columbia um, to better understand what British Columbians are doing in terms of advanced care planning. And I want you to situate yourself and answer these questions of where do you fit in these categories? So we learned that over 70% of British Columbians and in Canada, it's actually about 80 to 85% of Canadians have thought about what matters most to them regarding their health care. And again, the fact that you're attending this session right now tells me that you probably fit within that category. I want you to think about if you fit in these next few categories. 50%, nearly 50% of British Columbians have discussed this with their family. So how many of you have actually talked about this with your family? 27% have documented their wishes. So we've now gone down a little bit more. But even more concerning is that only 10% of us have discussed this with our healthcare providers. Now, is that your fault? I say no, I like to blame our healthcare providers and I'm one of them. Um, and so when we do education with our healthcare providers, we tell them over 70% of British Columbians are already thinking about this. We as healthcare providers just need to ask the right questions so that we can better, better gather this information. So what I wanna do again, I wanna highlight uh, in the chat uh, that workbook, I'm gonna put it up one more time just for those of you who maybe just joined and don't see in the chat but there's a workbook called My Voice in Action that follows these five steps of advanced care planning that we're gonna talk about today. But when you look at these five steps of think, learn, decide, talk, and record, maybe it's because it's lunchtime where I am, but when I look at this diagram, it looks like a pie. The arrows even look like the crust, um, and it just looks like a pie to me. And much to my mother's chagrin, I still don't eat pie in a very polite linear fashion. I just go for whatever piece looks most delicious, whether it's a big piece, a little piece, a medium piece, it doesn't matter if it's right in the right order. It's the same thing with these five steps of advanced care planning. It is not meant to be a linear experience. So even the workbook, it's set up in steps one through five. We don't expect you to go on that linear order. Start where you feel comfortable. If you wanna start and think and then jump over to talk, great. If you wanna start and learn and jump over to record, brilliant. If you're just ready to focus on the decide step, then just focus on the decide step. But don't feel like you need to do one through five in a linear fashion. So what are we asking you to think about? Well, when it comes to thinking, what we've discovered in the research and in real life experience, and maybe you can agree, is that we all make our decisions based on our values. 
And so whether you know it or not, the food that you chose to eat for breakfast this morning, or maybe the food you didn't eat, um, the clothes that you chose to, to, to wear, the, the choice to even to attend this session, all of those choices were informed by your values, namely what's important to you. Um, and, and so when we think about that, it's the same thing with our healthcare decisions. We make our healthcare decisions based on our values, based on what's important to us and how we want to live. So that's really the most important place to start is to think about, well, what are my values? But I know that if I asked you that question, and I learned very quickly as a social worker, when I asked uh, patients that question of what are your values, um, I would often get blank stares because that's a very abstract question. So another way to ask ourselves, what are my values, are to ask yourself, well, what gives my life meaning? What gives my life purpose? What, what gives my life joy? You know, what does a good day look like or a good weekend look like? And how do I like to spend my time? What I would often do with patients and their families is I would often ask them to make a, what I call a joy list. Um, and so I would write down at least three, maybe five things that brought them joy. And then knowing that you have that joy list. So for example, I have a, my wife's joy list on my phone. So if my wife was ever in an emergency health crisis and she was unable to speak or communicate for herself, I would have the ability to pull out that joy list with the physician and discuss the treatment options that were being offered in the context of the things that were important to her and that she still wants to do after that treatment. So I really encourage you to start thinking about what is it that brings my life joy? Um, and what about the people around me? What brings their life joy? And how does knowing that help me make a good healthcare decision potentially on their behalf um, or for myself in making my healthcare decisions. For example, when I went to the doctor recently because of uh, knee pain that I was experiencing, I waited months and months and months to finally address it. But what made me finally give in and go and visit my family doctor about my knee pain is when my, is when my daughter wanted to run from the car to the school classroom and I could no longer run with her. And so suddenly it was a value making the decision for me. What was important to me was being able to run with my daughter. What was important to me was being active with her. And because of that, I now am making healthcare decisions related to that treatment, that pain management, and even that rehab uh, informed by that value. And I've made sure that my physician knows that value that's guiding those decisions. The second, second step of advanced care planning is learn. We're asking you to learn about a few different things. The first thing we ask you to learn about is actually about your preferences. So ask yourself, how much do you even like to know about your health? Some of us like to know everything, including Dr. Google telling us a little bit more. Um, and some of us like to know very little, just, just the, the, the small details. Um, and then how do I like to receive that information? Some of us prefer to hear it orally, verbally, I should say. Um, some of us want it in writing. Others prefer some diagrams or some visuals um, to better understand that information. And finally, asking ourselves, how do I even like to make healthcare decisions? Um, when we know how we like to make healthcare decisions, whether we like to make them independently, um, in collaboration with our family, or maybe we even prefer to just defer to the physician and the healthcare team, and that's fine too. I'll tell you why these preferences are so important. I remember working um, on an oncology unit, so where people live, uh, were diagnosed and living with cancer. And I remember there was a patient who we found out didn't even know that she had cancer and she had quite progressive cancer and was receiving a lot of treatment. Um, and I was surprised that she didn't know. And I was actually angry and upset that this family hadn't even told this patient that she has cancer. And so I rallied the entire medical team together and got them all furious with me. And we went into that room and we were ready to just pull back the curtain and tell this, this, this woman that she had cancer and that she had a right to know that she had cancer and she had a right to know how, how serious it was and what treatments we were giving her. And as we pulled back the curtain, I stopped us before we jumped right in and I said, wait, how much information do you even wanna know about your health? And she looked at us, she says, I don't wanna know anything. I, I, I let my family make all the decisions. So please just tell them everything that's going on. I don't wanna know anything. And boy, was I grateful that we asked that question about her preferences. Um, and that she even knew what her preferences were, because it would have made such a mistake. It wouldn't have been her preference or values. And notice that her values are different than mine. My values say I want as much information as possible. And that's why I was so angry that she didn't even know. Her preferences were I want as little to no information as possible. And that's okay. It's not for us to judge people's preferences or values. Another thing that we want you to learn about is about your health. 
We want you to know more about what's going on with your health, especially if you've been diagnosed with any chronic or serious health issues. And when we say we want you to learn about your health, we don't want you to just learn based on what Dr. Google tells you about diabetes or about COPD or about congestive heart failure. We want you to ask your physician and your healthcare providers, what does this mean for you personally and the way that you want to live? You know, what does my health condition mean for me in my life? What are the possible big changes that I should be preparing for? And what are the possible treatments? And could there be any complications? Oftentimes, people are quick to say, Andrew, that sounds wonderful, except I don't know if you've noticed, but family doctors don't give us more than five to 10 minutes of time. And you're right except family doctors do have the ability to bill for advanced care planning conversations if you ask for one. So make sure that if you wanna have an advanced care planning conversations where you can ask these questions and learn more about your health and maybe even invite someone to come with you um, who's important to you so that they can understand what's going on with your health also, that you can ask for that advanced care planning conversation. So hopefully they will make a little bit more time, anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes instead. Um, and I know that sounds so generous. What do I need to know about the law? Well, we need to know that British Columbia does have laws that apply to each of us and that they're different from other provinces. I'm an Im immigrant from Ontario, as some of you may have heard earlier when Andrea and I were talking. And so the laws are different in Ontario and the legal language is different in Ontario. And so better understanding what are the legal documents that I might need, which documents actually need legal help. So do I need to get a lawyer or a notary involved or can I do that on my own? And finally, who will legally speak for me if I'm not able to? And we're gonna talk about that. Uh, in, in the next section, in the, in the third step. But let's talk about some of these legal documents, because again, as I said, they differ um, from province and, and territory uh, across Canada. So here in British Columbia, when we talk about a power of attorney or an enduring power of attorney, that power of attorney only has the ability to make decisions related to your finances or legal decisions. Though it has nothing to do with your health or personal care. In other provinces and territories, they sometimes use that language, like in Ontario, it's called a power of attorney for healthcare decisions, but not here. When we talk about a power of attorney, it is only for financial and legal decisions. Here in British Columbia, when we talk about choosing someone in advance to, to speak for us, we call it a representative or a representation agreement. And so if we complete a representation agreement, we're identifying someone and even an alternate, if that someone is not available, who would be able to articulate and speak for us on behalf of our healthcare wishes and our personal care decisions. And finally, there's a third legal document. And when we say legal documents, we're not saying these have to be completed with a lawyer. Um, oftentimes, healthcare forms should actually be completed with your physician um, so that you understand the, the benefits and the risks related to the decisions that you're making. An advanced directive is a medical is a legal document that you complete that we strongly encourage that you meet with your healthcare provider when you complete this document. And the reason why is because you put in you're putting in writing treatments that you for sure always want or for sure never want. So for example, if for religious or cultural reasons you don't ever want blood transfusions, this might be a really good time to do an advanced directive that puts in writing that you do not want blood transfusions. Or maybe you have been uh, on a breathing machine so many times in the last six months that you know it caused you such distress and concern and you never want that op option again, you could put it on there. But let me show you why an advanced directive is not right for everyone. Let's say for me, you'll probably notice I love to talk, I'm a communicator, I enjoy good, meaningful conversations. As a result, the idea of being on a breathing machine at the end of my life and not being able to have those meaningful conversations is exactly what I don't want. And so let's say I go to my doctor and I complete an advance directive and I write, I never want to be on a breathing machine. Now, tomorrow when I'm going for my walk in the afternoon, I cross the street. And as I cross the street, I'm unfortunately hit by a bus. Now, I'm unconscious and I'm taken to the hospital and my wife and my family are there. And the doctor says, you know what? What we need to do for Andrew is we need to give his, his, his lungs and we need to give his brain uh, a break and give him some more oxygen. And so we're deciding that we should put him on a breathing machine just for three days. And after three days, Andrew will be stable enough and well enough to be exactly how he was before the accident. Well, you can imagine my family, to my family, that sounds like a really great idea, except I've already written an advanced directive that said I never want that treatment. I never want a breathing machine. And so they actually would not be able to say yes to that treatment. 
Instead, what would have been more helpful to my family instead of an advanced directive that said yes or no to a specific treatment is if my family actually knew what was important to me. Remember my values? You know, what's important to me is that meaningful communication. So instead, they could have asked a physician, well, will Andrew still be able to have meaningful conversations with those who are with the people who are important to him after being on a breathing machine for three days? And when the physician says, of course he will, then they're able to make a decision that, that, that aligns with how I want to live, not just what I thought I may or may not want in that moment. I hope that makes sense. Um, and I'm hopeful that we're going to have time for some questions at the end too, because um, they're probably coming up as we go. The third step is decide. And this is the legal section. And I don't mean to scare you when I say legal, as much as it's just important to understand that there are some laws related to who can speak for us um, in terms of our, our situation. So I want you to stop for a second and think about that there might come a time, a, what, a time when you're not able to speak for yourself and someone's gonna have to make medical decisions for you. And many of us think about that time as closer to the end of our life, which is true that that may or may not be when it happens. But as I gave that example of being hit by the car, um, sometimes we might even just be unconscious for a couple of hours. And still there might be some healthcare decisions that need to be made during that moment. I often think of times where even when we're on serious medication, when we're in the hospital, that makes us a little delirious or maybe makes our, 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 our uh, thought process a little foggy. Um, that's another time where we might need someone else to speak for us. So it's not just at the end of life or just when we're seriously unwell. Um, there could be temporary moments where we need someone else to speak for us. I want you to stop and think about what are the kind of qualities that you would want that person to have. So not necessarily thinking about the person themselves, but I want you to think about the qualities because we're often quick to think about, oh, this would be my spouse, this would be my daughter, this would be my close friend. But what are some of the qualities that you want that person to have? You know, possibly you want them to be a good listener. Maybe you want them to be a good advocate, someone who will speak up on your behalf. Perhaps you want to have someone who is good in a crisis. Um, and maybe that isn't your spouse. Maybe you didn't marry them because they were good in a crisis. Maybe you want someone who has a little bit of medical knowledge or information or just ask really good questions. Um, maybe you want someone who has similar values to you, or maybe it doesn't matter as long as they're willing to know and follow your values. But again, when we think about the qualities, sometimes it makes it clear that certain people in our life actually aren't the right people for us to choose for substitute decision makers. And that's okay. Choosing someone to speak for us is not a love competition. It's not about who do we love the most. It's about who would be best to support us in that situation. And to be honest, it might actually be the greatest gift that you offer to someone you do love for them not to be that person so that they can just be a family member in that moment of crisis and not have to be the decision maker also. So what do we mean when we talk about substitute decision making? Well, here in British Columbia, we do have a hierarchy or an order in which we must as healthcare providers go to in terms of getting consent for healthcare treatments. So let me show you that. You'll notice right at the very top, and I'll use the example of again, getting hit by the bus. And I really hope that doesn't happen tomorrow the more I talk about this, <laughs> knock on wood. Um, but if we use the example of getting hit by a bus, so long as I'm a capable adult in that moment after getting hit by the bus, meaning that I'm awake, I'm aware, I'm able to understand and appreciate the risks and the benefits of the, the healthcare decisions that are being offered me, they're always going to go to me. It doesn't matter if my wife wants something else or my mom comes in and says, do this, do this. As long as I'm a capable adult, they're always going to come to me for consent when it comes to healthcare decisions. However, if I am, if I'm not a capable adult, and let's say it's because I'm, I'm now on so much pain medication and morphine um, because of being hit by that car, and they notice that I broke my femur and I need to go in for surgery to fix my leg. And so a decision now needs to be made about whether or not I want to go in for that surgery to fix my leg. And because I'm now so uh, delirious or, or not clear while on that morphine, instead, they now need to say, well, let's go to letter B. Is there a, a court appointed comma T? What does that mean? It basically is not very common. It's typically people who have very severe intellectual disabilities or mental health issues who really do not have the capacity to make decisions for themselves in any way. And so a family has chosen to go to court and allow a judge to appoint a representative or a decision maker or guardian for that person. Um, and so 
I don't have a court appointed committee. So at this point, they're going to keep going down that list and they're going to check in and say, well, does Andrew have a representative? Has he completed a representation agreement beforehand where he's already decided who would make decisions for him and who his alternate would be if we can't get a hold of that person? I actually don't have a representation agreement and I'll tell you why in a minute, but I don't. So they're going to have to keep going down this list. And then they're going to say, well, does Andrew have an advanced directive? And remember why that's important. That's because even when there is a representative, um, they need to still follow my legal wishes that I've already put in writing. And so if I have completed an advance directive, it's important that we find it and that we identify what I've articulated in advance. As I've shared already, I don't have an advance directive because I feel that it's more meaningful for my family and my friends to know what's important to me and how I want to live than it is for me to choose treatments that I for sure do not want. So at this point, we're now at letter E. I want you to know that most people in British Columbia end up at letter E because not a lot of us have a court appointed committee, not a lot of us have a representation agreement completed, and not a lot of us even have an advanced directive. So we suddenly need what's called a temporary substitute decision maker. That's a terrible title. It really should be a temporary substitute communicator because really a good temporary substitute decision maker is one who's just communicating what your wishes are, not actually having to make the decisions themselves. But I guess that depends on whether or not we've even talked to them or shared what's important to us. So look at this list and you'll notice that the first person they're gonna to go to in my situation about whether or not to do surgery on my leg is my spouse. And spouse can be both common law or same gender. But in my case, my spouse is typically busy with our toddler and she probably isn't available by phone very easily. Um, it, it more often goes to her voicemail than gets a pick, picked up. So they're now gonna go to my adult children. Well, I actually don't have any adult children. My children are, are two and seven. Um, and so that's not the case that, that would apply to me. They're now gonna go to my parents. My parents, again, my dad is working and my mom is typically out um, running errands for grandchildren that she adores. And so they might not even be uh, available. And so suddenly we're now to my brothers and sisters. Notice that you may not have expected that your brother or sister was going to be the one making the decision for you. You may have thought it would have always been your spouse or for me, my parents or my adult children. Um, but it very quickly can go down. I want to point out that from number two to six, we've got adult children, parent, brother, or sister, grandparent, and grandchild. Notice that it says equally ranked beside. That's because if you have five adult children, all five adult children have the ability, uh, are, are expected, uh, not expected, that's the wrong word. All, of the, all five adult children have a vote on the island or basically have a voice to articulate, articulate whether they would or would not want something. Parents, it would be both my mom and dad who would, would, would need to provide consent. Brothers, sisters, it would have to be all four of my brothers and sisters, um, grandparents and so forth. So a lot of people who are sitting here saying, well, wait, you know, I have one adult child who knows me better than others and who has those qualities when I think about a good decision maker. So what would I do if I wanted them to just go to one? Well, that would be a good time to do a representation agreement um, where you can articulate, this is the, the, the one child I for sure want you to go to. Um, the same thing when it comes to parents, maybe your mom would be in a better position to do this than your dad, um, or when you think of your grandchildren or your siblings. And again, that's a really good time to do a representation agreement. The reason I don't have representation agreement is that when I went to do one, I realized that I was fine with this order and I was okay with them being equally ranked. Um, but notice that for some of you who maybe were thinking about a close friend who would be a good substitute decision maker, it's all the way down at number eight. So again, if you have a close friend who would be the best substitute decision maker for you, that's a really good time to do a representation agreement so that we do go to your close friend rather than going through all those family members before we get there. And finally, well, what happens when we don't have anyone in our lives uh, or anyone in those one through nine categories? Well, we go to what's called the public guardian and trustee, which is a, a government organization based out of Vancouver, located in Vancouver, I should say. And basically what it is, is that it's individuals who we would call and tell them the situation and they would either appoint someone in that person's life to be the decision maker, or they would give consent themselves. The nice part about public guardian and trustee is that they don't wanna be in that situation any more than you want them to be in it. And I've always appreciated every interaction that I've had with them because usually what they would do if they, call, if they were called in this situation and said, hey, Andrew needs surgery on his leg um, and we don't have anyone who can give consent, what do you think? As long as it wasn't an emergency surgery that needed to be done immediately, 
what they could do is stop and say, is there anyone we can talk to? Or did Andrew write anything down to tell us what's important to him and how he wants to live so that we can make the decision based on that? So they're really good that when it's not an emergency situation, that they're always going to check and see if they can learn more about this person so that the decision aligns with who they are, just as we all should when it comes to being a substitute decision maker. Now that's a lot of information, so deep breath, but I'm gonna move on just for sake of timing. Um, what's important to know is that to be a temporary substitute decision maker, you do need to be 19 years of age, which is the age of consent in BC. They need to be willing, so they need to want to do it. They could decline to do it and they need to be capable. So they need to have the capacity to do it. There needs to be no conflict or dispute in the last 12 months because that means they probably wouldn't always honor your wishes. And they need to have contact within the last 12 months so that they even know what your wishes are. And my favorite part about the laws in British Columbia is that in order to be a substitute decision maker, you must legally, uh, you are legally obligated, forgive me, to honor the person's wishes. All the more reason for people to even know what your wishes are, or what's important to you. How do we do that? We talk, we have these conversations. And who do I talk to? You talk to all the people who are important to your life. Uh, this is not meant to be kept a secret. Uh, the more people who know, the better. I've heard people say when I was in Abbotsford, they said we should spread this information around like manure. Um, people say we should spread it around like glitter. If you've ever seen glitter go everywhere, uh, we should talk to as many people as possible. So think about the people who give you strength and support. You know, when you're having a really good day, who do you talk to? When you're having a really hard day, who do you talk to? Those are the type of people that we should be talking to. How do I talk to them? Well, try starting out with some conversation starters. Like, I want to talk to you about what's important to me. Not, I want to talk about the end of my life or how I want to die. That's not what we're talking about. We're really talking about living and how we want to live. Uh, I think it's also important that we think, I think it's also important that we think about, I'd like to go, who we would like to go to medical appointments with us. Um, I think it's really important that my family understands my wishes. And finally, I found that a lot of people start these conversations really well based on talking about what's going on in the media. And so it might be a really good idea to even talk a little bit about um, this recent flooding. Can I tell you what would happen if I uh, was in an emergency health situation after flooding or after being stranded on the highway? Here are the things that are important to me or how I would want to live in that situation. And finally, record. But when we say record, we actually don't mean that you need to write things down. Some people choose to do video recordings and share that with the people who are important to them. Some people do audio recordings and some people do write it down. And then we have what's, what are these great green sleeve envelopes where you can put all your advanced care planning information in that green sleeve and it can go on your fridge. Not only so that you know where it is and your family and friends know where it is, but so that medical first responders know where it is so they can look for your wishes if you were ever to have an emergency. Where do you get this green sleeve? Well, you can contact our team and we'll have that information up shortly. I encourage you to look for more information on these websites. Advancedcareplanning.ca is our national advanced care planning site. We've got our People's Law School, which is a really great British Columbian organization about the law in very simple terms. And then you've got our Fraser Health website, which is fraserhealth.ca slash ACP. And all that information is in the workbook that I shared. So finally, if you have more questions, know that our team is always available by phone. You'll see our email address there and our website as well. We want to answer your questions. We want to support you while you're filling in uh, your workbook. And especially we want to send you green sleeves if you would like a green sleeve to share your advanced care planning information. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop. I think we've got two minutes, but if you have any questions, uh, you're welcome to write them in the chat. Thanks so much, Andrew. No yeah, we've problem. got two minutes. If you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat. People are so overwhelmed by the information. They're just like, how could I have questions? That was so much. It was. It was um, so much. But but really but start crazy. where you're at, guys. Start where you're at. Don't don't rush the process. This is not an event that needs to be completed tonight or tomorrow. This is a, this is a process and a journey. Well, I just want to thank you for uh, once again uh, supporting us. Oh, uh, we do have one question. Um, yeah, standard forms. So great question. So most of the forms you're going to find if you, if you Google, if you go on the internet and just Google my voice, advanced care planning, 
there's a British Columbia My Voice workbook that has all the forms in it for representation agreements, advanced directives, and you don't need to complete them with a lawyer. They're, they're meant to just be completed with two witnesses to save all of us the notary costs and the lawyer fees. Great question. That's great. I'll put the link in the chat in just a moment. Awesome. About that. Um, thanks, everyone. And uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, of course. Once again, supporting uh, seniors in our community. It's really great to have you here. Thank you so much. Okay. Have a good afternoon. Take care.